Welcome to everybody. Both here in our conference room, Igor Kasse, and also online via Zoom. To our today's um, lecture in the Joseph C. Miller Memorial Lecture Series, I have the pleasure to introduce to you our today's speaker, Natalita, from the University of Vienna. Before I come to her research interests and publication activities, I will try to summarize for your academic background. Nadine studied classical archaeology, ancient history, and classical philology at the University of Vienna. In 2019, she became a doctoral fellow in Roman history at the University of Vienna and was appointed for four years as a new doctoral research assistant at the Department of Ancient History, Archaeology, and Epigraphy. And this also placed her be my trust in much. Currently, she is holding a Mariette Blau scholarship. <laughs> From the Austrian Agency for Education and Internationalization, URD, which allows her to conduct research at the University of Konstanz in Germany for a period of six months and to finish writing her PhD thesis. Her research aims at opening up new perspectives in the field of ancient history by including approaches of gender studies and intersectionality. Among her most important research interests are the later Roman Empire mobility studies, women's and gender history in Roman antiquity, and studying literary letters from an intersectional point of view. Her most recent publication is an article about female travel networks in the handbook series Early Christian Centers, which is currently in preparation for publication. In the past, she has been involved in the production of several episodes of the podcast Doctorate, which covers important topics like time management, overcoming setbacks, parenting as a PhD researcher, or decolonizing academia. Furthermore, she has been co-editor of the edited volume Akten des 17. Österreichischen Altersvolkerin und Altersvolkertag, which was published in 2020 in the series Wiener Beiträge zur Alten Geschichte Online, and contains the papers held at a conference in Vienna in 2018. In her current PhD project, which is also the topic of her lecture today, she is looking for mobility stories in literary and documentary letters from the later Roman Empire and tries to explore the dependencies and underlying power factors from an intersectional point of view. Nadine, we are very happy that you are here in Bonn and we are looking forward to your talk on the move, gender and mobility in latency letters. Thank you very much, Patrick, for the nice introduction. Hello and a good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much uh, also to the organizers for inviting me to this great um, lecture series. Um, at the moment, I'm at the historically interesting late concerns that you, that you already heard to, um, to finish my PhD project um, with the financial help of a Maria de Blaubrand. But I'm more than happy to that I, that I hit the road and took the train to come to the historically interesting city of Bonn to present a part of my PhD project to you. Um, the two keywords, road and train, lead me directly to the title of today's talk, talk that you have that you have already heard, on the move, gender and mobility in latency letters. Here you can see the structure of today's talk. Um, at first, there is going to be an introduction. Then I'll give you an overview of my PhD project. Um, I will show you snippets of the gender discourse uh, in my sources before I, came, I, I come to the main part of today's talk, so-called mobility stories. And then there is a conclusion. Money and properties dominate studies about the symmetries and inequalities for a very long time. Only in the 1960s and 1970s, researchers acknowledged the fundamental character of sex and gender for shaping society. Gender inequality is often based on social consequences. The inequality is based on how society perceives gender and sex. For example, society ascribes certain behaviors to men and women. Different genders are linked to certain expectations. To name one stereotypical expectation, men are, men are strong and women are weak. These ideas about men and women 
impact people's lives and lead to inequality. In modern mobility studies too, gender has been seen as a fundamental factor for structuring migration and mobility. Many researchers had and still have the idea that in general, mobile women are dependent on male, male relatives. In their view, women are not mobile to fulfill their own goals. They rather follow their husbands, their brothers, or their male relatives. Um, and they are rather seen as um, travel companions, not so much as the supervision makers. Many mobility studies link the female gender with low agency or none at all. In my dissertation, agency denotes the capacity of people to shape their life course for their own mobility. Additionally, agency denotes the capacity of people to influence the life course or the mobility of other people. According to Michel Foucault, if a person is influencing or trying to influence um, the life course or the mobility of another person, then there is a power relation. These power relations are shaped by the involved actors and by, by society, for example, how society perceives gender. So ideas about gender led to the assumption that women were fellow companions, not decision makers. For antiquity, there are, or rather were, similar ideas. Based on epigraphic evidence from the Roman Empire, Brad Wolf concluded in 2013 that women traveled less frequently than men, and when they did travel, it was as wives, sisters, and mothers if they were lucky, and slaves if they were not. In Wolf's opinion, women traveled as companions. Their mobility was influenced by other people, by male relatives. In a nutshell, this assumption builds on the Roman institutions of Catria Protesta and Tortella. These two institutions shaped the ancient ideas about gender hierarchy. In short, and reduced, Catria Protesta and Tortella positioned women under the authority of their husbands, their fathers, or their male guardians. Indirectly, Wood's argumentation undermines women's agency, so he does not state directly that they don't have agency, but indirectly he undermines it. Women's understanding of women as travel companions corresponds with the idea of numerous ancient historians before him. However, in 2013, so when Wolf wrote the article, um, there were other ideas out there. Wolf seemed not to be aware of the development of a general trend in mobility studies focusing on gender. Shortly after him, researchers began to focus intensively on female mobility. Uh, my PhD project is continuing the work. To illustrate the idea of dependent mobile women, I will give you an example. In a papyrus from the 4th century, Vitalius wrote to his mother, I wanted to come to you before the celebration, and my sister Mika stopped me, telling me, arrive at a mother first for the end of the fast. Vitalius' original plan to visit his mother was changed by his sister. He went on, expect my sister, I am coming for the celebration. Vitalius and Vinke wanted to go to their mother right about the time of Easter. Before the Greek infection, Vitalius wrote that his mother should not worry. He would pay the bill for his sister. Do not be anxious about the fair for me that I can give instead of you. Here, a woman and a man, a woman and a male relative are on the move. Within the majority of migration and mobility studies without focus on gender, this journey of Mika would probably be categorized as a typical example for a dependent mobility. At the end of my paper, I will come back to this example and show you that, that things are more complex. This idea of dependent mobile women was the starting point for my PhD project. The working title of my thesis is Gehen oder Bleiben? Mobilitätsbeschreibungen in spätantiken Gruppen. For my dissertation, I read approximately 2,700 literary letters from the 4th and 5th century, 
written by Jerome Ibanez, Sumacus, and Sumacus. In the letters, there are many descriptions of journeys and migration, which I call mobility stories. The literary letters mostly tell stories of mobile men from the highest echelons of society, but there are exceptions as well. The writers, as well as the recipients and the readers of the published letters, belong to a similar social circle. To provide a contrast to the letters written by elite men, their campers, um, and their worldview, I additionally read documentary letters. Documentary letters on papyri and ostraca open up the field into a broader spectrum of the population. They offer a kind of corrective and complement the mobility stories of the literary letters. Using literary and documentary letters entails certain caveats. When working with papyri, one has to know the customs of papyrology, the art of paleography, and basically it's the work of a detective. Analyzing literary letters from a gender point of view regrets knowledge of the linguistic term and its consequences. So philological and papyrological um, knowledge is needed. The efforts are worth it because letters offer treasure to study ancient mobility. Letters were sent to establish and to keep contact to absent people. And until now, researchers have mostly neglected efforts to study mobility. In my project, mobility stories serve as a lens for examining asymmetries and inequalities. I pursue questions of social and cultural history. My project intends to answer two main questions. The first question is, who, who did the writers describe as being mobile? Second question is, how did different people gain influence to shape the mobility of themselves and others? Mobility stories serve as examples to answer these questions. Furthermore, I'm comparing literary and documentary letters, and I'm drawing on discourse analysis. Overarching this, I investigate the value of letters for mobility study and the mobility of late antique society in general. To answer my two main questions, I am analyzing mobility stories along the factors gender, family status, health status, wealth, and age. These factors, all these factors can influence on mobility. In today's paper, I will focus on the second question and um, on the factor gender. How did women and men gain influence to shape the mobility of themselves and others? When we speak about mobility of women and women, it is worthwhile to speak about gender and the age of gender, as I explained a few minutes ago. For historians, the gender definition by Joan Stock is the question. Stock understands gender as a useful category to analyze history. She said, Gender is a primary field within which, or by means of which, power is articulated. This means, if the access to economic, social, and cultural resources is regulated on the basis of a third gender hierarchy, then gender is involved in the conception and construction of power. To give a simplifying example, if society thinks that men are strong and women are weak, only men will get jobs where physical and mental strength is needed. So only men have powerful positions regarding, job, regarding jobs. In this example, gender is involved in the distribution of power. The same scheme um, was applied to mobility. If women were only mobile in the tendency of men, their access to the resource mobility was limited because of their female gender. Using Scott's understand, understanding of gender as a category of analysis, perhaps deconstructing gender and its meaning, for example, from mobility. The goal of gender approaches is to stop perpetuating certain assumptions about gender. Scott's definition is um, a good starting point. Another idea is to use an intersectional perspective. Based on Kimberly Crenshaw, an intersectional approach is looking into different privileging and or marginalizing factors like race, class, age, etc. This way, women or other groups of people are not seen as one uniform group 
but are differentiated along other categories. An intersectional approach also counteracts some Eastern theorist view, for example, on gender. So, how was gender perceived in antiquity, and especially by the authors of the letters central to my project? Ancient society subordinated women to men because of the so called inclimiter sex. This asymmetrical gender hierarchy was considered natural. Um, it's basically the weakness due to the due to the due to the sex that the translation done when it was The female weakness was related to women's lack of physical strength, their child theory, their lack of education, lack of life experience, um, but also due to their dependency on male relatives and their emotional vulnerability. These are typically images of women in antiquity. At the same time, um, we know of female mind workers, and working in an ancient mind was not exactly a bump on the road. And we do know about Christian women who endured the most severe tortures as part of the martyrdom. These examples show the image of the weak women was not universal. However, the field on women as free sex was even legally codified. In legal disputes, women received leniency because of their sex. A passage of the Digest, that's a compilation, a law compilation of the 6th century, uh, there is stated. Those under 25 are allowed to be ignorant of the law. So are women in some cases, owing to the infirmity of their sex. The lack of legal knowledge was a sound reason to show leniency toward people under, under 25 years. The same applied to women because of their weak sex. Even if this mitigating circumstance was not applied in all cases, the inclusion of inhibitor sexes in a body of law is, signif is significant. A former literary topos was transformed into a legal norm and thus into a commonplace. Ideas about the biological sex form an asymmetrical gender hierarchy, which is also tangible in the letters and through to my project. This uh, is a passage from a letter written by Jerome at the beginning of the 5th century, Salvina, a widow. In his works, the church father Jerome promoted chastity, being single, and an ascetic way of life. According to the church father, the ascetic lifestyle was especially hard for women. One reason was the lack, the lack of self-control over their sexual desire. In the letter, Jerome wrote, The reputation of a woman is a delicate thing. Like a beautiful flower is wilting quickly by a slight touch, so her reputation is spoiled by a fleeting breath. Especially if she is reaching an age susceptible for temptation and her husband's authority is missing. His shadow is her safeguard. Jerome stated that he wanted to avoid the sexual temptation as a woman was a husband. Only when getting older, women were able to control their desires better, according to Jerome. Hence, Jerome promoted virginity and widowhood. And if you ask why widowhood, if elder women had better control over their um, sexual desires, well, Roman women usually married at a very young age. Their husbands were usually older and died when the wives were, old, were still young. That's why it was no contradiction for Jerome to promote widowhood and still state that a higher age heightened the self control. The letters contain many similar thoughts about women and portray them as the weak sex. I could show you a dozen examples, but our time here is limited, and um, I rather I, I rather going to show you that this weakness and that weakness did not only apply to women. In this letter, there is an instance from the first quarter of the fifth century. A man attributed weakness and unmanly quality to himself. Everything I love is gone. I accuse my own nature of feeling unjustly treated. If philosophy gives advantage, I shall renew myself in manly virtue, and you will find me hard and steadfast. His brother and his niece left Tunisius alone. This loneliness made Tunisius feel unjustly treated. 
In his opinion, philosophy was going to help him back to manly, to manly virtue. By implication, Tunisians felt unmanly during Latin December. With the help of philosophy, he would be hard and steadfast again, two key uh, qualities of masculinity. Men too could be weak. They had to prove their manliness again and again. In some cases, men were even described as women. Athenia made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land to her forgiveness. She and her husband barged for a spiritual marriage, but sinned against it. Whereas Athenia was in the Holy Land, her husband was in the fulfilling oil. And Jerome wrote him a letter to ask him, Why are you coming to the Holy Land? And in a letter from the beginning of the 5th century, Jerome wrote about the obstacles in the way of Amosticus. O oh, shame, the weaker sex conquers the world, the stronger sex is conquered. And with the canonic woman she, Athena, says, My daughter is severely tortured by Athena. I will rightfully call your soul the daughter of her soul, which knows no difference of sex. She is inviting you like a baby sucking milk, and which cannot yet eat solid food. She is inviting you to baby milk and gives you nourishment like a wet nurse. At first, Rodicus wanted to follow his wife to the Holy Land, but he did not manage, manage to make the journey. Technically, as a man, Rusticus belonged to the, uh, to the stronger sex. However, in this, uh, in this letter, Jerome paralleled him uh, with the sick daughter. Athena is paralleled with the mother in, with the ma mother in the Bible. Um, in the Bible, um, there, are two, there is a mother and a sick daughter, both are pagans. And they come to Jesus, and um, the mother begs Jesus to cure, to cure her daughter, and Jesus cured her daughter. And here, Jerome compared a man with a woman. Rusticus impersonated a woman. Such a gender transgression was also possible for women. In Jerome's letters, we find many manly women. Here, I give you just one example. In a letter from the end of the fourth century, Theodora even overcame the female gender. She, Theodora, is with you. She was formerly a companion in the flesh, now in the spirit. Once she was your spouse, now your sister. Once she was a woman, now a man. Once she was an inferior, now an equal. By using three antithesis, by sister, woman, man, inferior, equal, and a climax, Jerome stressed the exceptionality of this woman. Theodora and her husband wanted to live in a spiritual marriage, or like brother and sister. Theodora's assimilation to the male gender made her sexual desires disappear or gave her control over them. By implication, we see at the same time the lack of self control attributed to women. The examples show two seemingly contradictory things. First, um, the authors, I mean, they did not know that there was a difference between your biological sex and the social gender, obviously that's a modern construct, but they made a difference between biological sex on the one hand and then something else, the social gender. Because gender was something fluid, as you saw in this example. Gender was not only defined by the biological sex, but also by actions. They can't this view about manly women and female men did not criticize the status quo of the gender hierarchy. Rather, Theodorus and Tunisia were noteworthy transgressions of normative gender boundaries. Authors like Jerome considered such gender transgressions possible. Some authors, however, considered such, such transgressions a danger. Uh, one way to trigger gender transgressions was mobility. In her article, The Lure of an Exotic Destination, Nadine Coubert examined literary texts in which Romans saw their Romanitas, their Romanists, threatened by products, by people, and by rights from the East, or simply by traveling there. This fear of mobility is visible in a letter written by Symmachus at the end of the fourth century. Meanwhile, daughter, I feel honored and enjoy your exquisite movement. For the love to your father and the seed of matrons are visible in you. This is how women used to lead their lives. And kinds of fair and pleasure order women to occupy themselves with spinning and weaving, because love is nourished by inactivity. 
But in your case, you who are staying in Valle, they were not able to stop you from the decent work. Renounce those who roam the seas and settle down or wander through thoughts and abysses of birds and believe that these pleasures are the only ones for your sense. Lumaru's daughter did not make it to her father during the party. Instead, she sent him some wool work. Working with textiles was the only adequate occupation for women. Women are again depicted um, as the weak sex. They are controlled by their lusts. Weaving and spinning distract women from their sexual desires. Lumaru's presented his daughter as role model. She even could not be distracted by the delights of Bayer and used her stay for woodwork and not for enjoying herself. You have to know that Bayer was a resort for upper class Romans at the day of Nazareth, and there were a lot of different entertainments there. So it's a wonder that she was busy with woodwork quite seven. In this letter, Sumachus used participants to suggest criticism of mobility and the risks asso associated with it. The daughter should stay in one place. Um, residents and not take part in the girls' amusements such as voting, start, start my relenticus, but avoid them. Symbolus was skeptical towards the mobility of his daughter. In his view, the female ideal was at stake. In antiquity, there was an asymmetrical gender hierarchy. In the literary discourse of the ancient uh, of the letters, women were seen as the weak sex. Men and male relatives watched over women. Otherwise, their femaleness was at stake. However, being ascribed to a gender was not something fixed. It was ruled, as we saw in the examples of multiple criteria. Gender transgression was positive. At the same time, examples of gender transgression confirmed the idea about an asymmetrical gender hierarchy. In the next part of my presentation, I am going to compare the general gender discourse in the letter with the impact of gender on agency in mobility stories. What influence did belong to a gender have on the agency in mobility? Let's take a step back and review our revised Ruth's argumentation. Ruth draws on the part of protesters and the tutela, as I already mentioned. These institutions were only valid for women who were not so yours of their own right. Three women were so yours. When the father was there, the father was uh, most time the role of the father of the Kessler, and when they had three children. Liberated women were sui juris when they had four children and the father was there. Um, so, what about women sui juris? What about women when no controlling male relatives um, were inside? No, uh, no controlling male relatives were inside. In 440, Jerome wrote a letter to Demetrius. The church father praised the virginity of the little day. In passing, the letter also tells us about the mobility of this young woman. Not long ago, you trembled in the hands of the barbarians and hid in the bosom and mantle of your grandmother and mother. Your city, once the head of the world, is the grave of the Roman, of the, uh, of the Roman people. Will you banish to the Libyan coast and accept exile as a husband? The Rome reported the sacking of Rome by the Goths and took the readers back to the year 410. They also emphasized the danger of the situation by comparing the city to a grave for the Roman people. Together with her grandmother Ova and her mother Julia, she fled to the African coast. Here we see three women on the move. Who was the decision maker? In the same letter, the Rome wrote, her grandmother and her mother are two extraordinary women. They have great, great authority to command, us, based in petitions and persistence to achieve what they asked for. Jero granted authorities to mother and grandmother. Ober and Julia were older and they were widowed. It seems only appropriate that Jerome granted them agency to influence the mobility of the younger people. On the journey, however, the author described Ova as active. She, Ova, had seen her burning pathway upon the sea and entrusted her own salvation and that of her people to a fragile boat. 
It seems plausible that Proba, as the oldest and most experienced member of the family, took the decisions that Jerome stated here. She had the agency to influence the mobility of the other two women. In this example, age and family status could be seen as important and even privileging markers for ages. Women did not only influence the mobility of other women, but also the agency of men, but the mobility of men. Eliador, a former closure and travel companion of Jerome, did not want to go on a journey. Jerome tried to change his mind with a letter. In this letter from the second half of the fourth century, the author spoke about the obstacles. Your little nephew could hang from the dick. Your mother with scattered hair and torn garments could show her breasts, with which she had nourished you. Your father could put himself down at the doorstep, trample over your father, lead to the sign of the cross. To be cruel in this matter is the only sign of true faith. Your widowed sister clings to you with her caressing arms. The slaves with whom you grew up say, to what master do you leave us? Your former name, now an old woman, a wet nurse, who precedes the father in natural law for about quite a moment until I died and burned me. Perhaps the mother of Satan Bunks and Third Brow joins in the sighting and recalls her meaning in childhood. Jerome described different members of Heliodor's household and how they tried to convince him to stay. We see Hux to hold him back, um, the door is blocked by a body. He is made to feel guilty. His mother even sings a song on his title. Jerome shows different people involved in the decision-making process of Heliodor. Besides the nephew and father, we also see some inner people. According to Jerome, the mother, the sister, and the nanny, the wet nurse, um, were involved in the decision-making process of Heliodor. According to Jerome, they had agency to influence Heliodor's mobility. We see a similar case with Bassianus. <coughs> Libanius described his mobility story in a letter from 363 sent to Christian. Do you see how much power you have through your own encompassing duty? Everything has been neglected by Bassianus, a wonderful grandmother, worthy brothers, noble uncles, an extensive pair of brilliant clan, a city equally brilliant, thousands of other things, and you alone are everything to him. And he is lured on and desires you and runs in the phrases of Paphlagonia. The character of the land, its abundance brings the senior by there is nothing that he doesn't praise. Now, even that dreadful code seems mine to him. Moreover, it's not Paphlagonia that has won him over for the region, rather, it's you and your spiritual qualities, and I might even add, your physical qualities as well. External circumstances did not stop Bassianus from going to his beloved Prisca. He left behind his grandmother, his brothers, and his uncle to go from Antiochia to Paphlagonia, even though Paphlagonia is described as not, not such a nice place. The author presented Prisca's duty as the reason for Bassianus to move. A woman influenced the decision making process of a man. According to Libanius, Priske had agency to influence Bastianus' mobility. In a letter written by Symmachus at the end of the 4th century, we read, we read the following mobility story. In Rome, I saw our son, Otarius, who lacked none of your family's superb qualities, except your letters. When I requested these, he replied that he had been ordered to travel from Gallia to Terua by his father-in-law, and that you, you were thus listening. The author complained to the recipient of the letter of Minervius. Symmachus still waited for a letter from him. This letter should be brought by Minervius' son in law, Potarius. Potarius had been stationed at the Rhine and was then in Rome. Using the perfect passive participle in Caratum, Symmachus described Potarius' journey to Rome as ordered by his father in law. We see Minervius was influencing the mobility of another younger man. Here, age and the position within family could explain how Minerius was able to influence the mobility of Potarius. A man shaped the mobility of another man. Not only the age, but also the occupation could influence one's agency and mobility stories. 
In a papyrus uh, from the midst of the fourth century, the mother of the soldier Moses wrote a letter to his superior Abinus. To my lord and patron, the Fatosibus, from the mother of Moses, I beg you and beseech you, Lord, to permit him with few days. The mother asked for a leave of absence. The army unit of her son was stationed somewhere at the northwest corner of the Fayum in Egypt. Due to his occupation and his lower position within the army, Moses could not just leave, but he had to get a permission. Here we see an asymmetric dependency. The mobility of Moses was influenced by his superior. On the other hand, we see again a woman with agency who tried to influence the mobility of a man. In the case of Synesius, he also described even an influence by God. In 409, Synesius got the opportunity to go to um, Ptolemaeus and to become bishop there. He wrote, if God puts it on me, I will take it on. In this story, Synesius attributed an influencing role to God mm -hmm. for his mobility decision. So different people, or in this case entities, could influence the decisions of other people concerning their mobility. The agency was not, was not always determined by one factor like gender. Sometimes other factors came into play as well. And different people try to influence the mobility of other people. To show you yet another example um, of how complex it is to assess one's agency and influence and mobility stories, I present another documentary. In the second, third century, a daughter sent a letter to her father, Caroline. She wrote, Don't bother coming up because the effort is not small. When you have found the opportunity, I trust Cassium and stay down with him. On the one hand, a woman wanted to go on a journey with another man. Yes, um, yeah, with Persia. However, the present active participant, Lambanisa, um, who has treated this Lambanisa, suggests an active role for the dog woman. On the other hand, we have a woman who tried to influence the mobility of her father. She did not forbid him to uh, she, did, she did not forbid him the journey, but suggested that, that he should stay home. She ascribed herself agency to shape the mobility of another older male world. Papyri are often not so easy to interpret because the sender and the receiver were aware of certain information that we modern readers are not. For example, in this letter, we don't know, we have no hints uh, of the absolute age of the people. We can only make guesses and assume a relative age ratio. In this case, we see a younger woman who decided to go on a journey and the older man who was possibly influenced by his daughter to stay. And now to go back to the beginning, to the story of Nick and Retalius, when we read the letter again, with this information I showed you so far, we see that actually Nike influenced the mobility of Italios. According to Italios, she told him and told him to arrive at her mother first for the end of the task. A woman again influenced the agency and mobility of a male relative. If they went together to their mother, it is not stated in the letter. And even if they went together, in the letter, we see a man who is ascribing agency to a, a female relative. To conclude, in the discourse of the letter, the idea of a weak female sex exists. However, the ideas of a gender are fluid. Certain qualities are connected with a certain gender. The authors seem to know, I mean, the major difference uh, between the biological sex and the social gender. Um, gender was something fluid, gender was not only defined by the biological sex, but also by actions. And um, gender transgressions also. I just remind you of the effeminate Rusticus, the husband of Artemia, Jerome par paralleled him with the daughter of the canonic woman. At the same time, um, Jerome presented Theodora as man. The letters present a flexible gender discourse about men and women. Similar things can be said when we talk about agency of men and women in mobility stories. So 
there is a dispute on the one hand, and then we have different practices on the other hand. It's nothing unfamiliar. Um, a general idea about women as travel companions without agency due to their female gender and the associated assumptions is too simplifying. Often the mobility stories offer insights into more complex situations. The nature of agency was influenced by her grandmother. Now, in this story, age and families that was came in. Heliodor and Cassiano's mobility was influenced by women by some relatives. Cortanius and Moses agency were shaped by all the relatives or by the superior. Caramon's daughter tried to form the mobility of her father. Cortanius and Mike saw the complexity of analyzing and interpreting the agency of different people in the mobility context. We saw how different people influenced the actions, the decisions, and the mobility of other people. Of course, we cannot analyze, um, I hope it's not too small. I hope we, we cannot analyze every letter in an intersectional way. It is especially hard with papyri in which the information is limited. Nonetheless, it is vital to keep in mind that women and other groups shaped by different factors like age, family status, etc., are not homogeneous blocks. Their mobility and agency have to be evaluated carefully and in a differentiated way. And last but not least, let us provide a differentiated insight into various factors shaping agency and mobility, and let us are a fruitful source for exploring mobility. Thank you very much.